Um, just growing up, though, was there, there a lot of music in, in your household growing up? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it was a strange mixture. I mean, it was all sorts. It was sort of Bill Haley, rock and roll, Little Richard, uh, Scottish sort of music at New Year's Eve, South Pacific. You know, it was all sorts of stuff, really. Yeah. And then some blues, a little bit of blues and old jazz. <laughs> Talk about those very early days in Warwick. The blues w was very much uh, your first focus, I believe, when, when you started playing music. Yeah, it was, because a lot of it seemed to be sort of, a, albeit quiet, but kind of rebellious and dirty and raw and sort of... Uh, uh, it was very difficult to shock my parents, so that was never, n never kind of like something we did as kids, you know, because they were so part of what we did. Uh, but, and they kind of, nobody ever told us, oh, you can't listen to that, or, uh, and we were unique, really, amongst our friends, I think, you know, I mean, kids used to come around our house, because it was like, it was like a club, it was, there was freedom there, you know, so, there was lots of music all the time, and blues, I suppose blues became um, our sort of big focus before sort of American West Coast music, and, and that sort of, uh, that movement. Mm -hmm. Talk about your first recording deal with, with Harvest. How did, how did that come to be? Well, we'd, we'd moved down to Notting Hill Gate, and we were living in a, a, a street called Colville Terrace. We couldn't live there now. It's, it's like so gentrified and so kind of like upmarket. It's unbelievable. Hmm. But the whole place was quite scruffy then, and we kind, of, we kind of moved in right in the middle of the whole sort of hippie thing kicking off. And we'd been in the street uh, uh, perhaps a few weeks, and somebody said, oh, there's a... There's an agency, you know, uh, a couple of streets away from We didn't know. So we wandered around there one day in our full sort of hippie attire, knocked on the door, Black Hill Enterprises, they let us in, and sort of we had a chat. Uh, and I think that night, or the next night, there was um, somebody pulled out of a gig at Imperial College, I believe it was. And uh, so Pete Jenner, the, the sort of uh, co-owner of Black Hill, sort of got us a gig there. And we played, and he said he'd never seen anything like it in his life, you know, and uh, signed us up. So now we had a manager and an agent. And he was in the middle of talking with uh, EMI Records uh, about the Harvest label. Um, so, I mean, it was incredible. It was so easy, really. Uh, that's how it happened. We just walked in someone's office and uh, did an audition at a gig, and that was it. We were, we were soon signed. I guess Harvest was a label that made its names with, with acts that were kind of a little outside of the mainstream. Did you feel comfortable being um, embedded into a, into a stable of acts like that? Oh yeah, very much so. Um, they were all a little bit off the, you know, off the sort of beaten track, the centre. And uh, yeah, there was such a such an eclectic mix of kind of styles. I mean, there was uh, there was folk singers there was kind of like uh, there was uh, right to us you know so the dynamics was was pretty interesting as well the kind of uh, the range of sort of music people like the third ear band you know who yeah. kind of just did instrumentals and uh, and kind of we were all mates well a lot of us were mates because we were signed to black hill you know um kevin ayres uh the floyd originally of course uh mike oldfield those kind of guys david bedford they were all in and out of the same kind of bands, Shirley and Dolly Collins. <coughs> you know, they, so we did gigs with, with these people as well. So it was a small family in a way, a lot of the time. So many times through the years I've seen comparisons uh, in reviews of, of your work, that your vocal style being compared to the likes of Howl and Wolf and Captain Beefheart. Were you, were you okay with those comparisons at the time? Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, I suppose there, there, was, there was a period of time when... Uh, that was quite flattering, things like that, you know, I mean, it was just to be compared at all. I, I was a, a Howling Wolf fan, I mean, I think uh, the most majestic of all the great voices, really, uh, fantastic. I mean, in blues. And then, of course, Beefheart, a kind of sort of like surreal kind of blues. And I could do that sort of thing a little bit, so I did. And, of course, I suppose the, uh, because we like Beefheart as well, the comparisons were inevitable, really. Yeah. But it didn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> Your band established a reputation for playing uh, free gigs, and, and often on the yeah. back, and often on the back of a track, and often coming across opposition from from the law. Uh, tell us yeah. about tell us about those days. Well, I think the first uh, back of a, a truck gig was in Warwick, our hometown, and uh, oh, that really, really did cause a bit of a sensation. You know, woke the whole place up really, and nobody had ever seen anything like that. Hell's Angels as sort of escort and all that. 
Then um, later we did a, a, a tour. Like, a, well, we tried to. We, we we set up all these gigs, and the only people that actually local authorities that let us do it were in Gravesend down in um, down in Kent, and that was fantastic. Um, we tried to do one at Redcar in the northeast, and we tried to do one at Brighton on the south coast, and we were arrested both times and uh, made some court appearances and. Uh, but we did a lot of other free gigs. We did a lot of benefits, you know, not on trucks, inside halls and stuff. Our bands used to come to us at certain gigs. I mean, I remember one EMI organized a big free concert in Frankfurt, and we, we, we headlined that. And afterwards, all sorts of bands were coming to me and saying, you can't do this, you can't do this, you'll, you'll, you'll destroy the business, you know, you'll destroy the market. And we just thought that was hilarious. <laughs> you know, sort of like hippie bands, as it were, coming along and saying... Uh, Stop! Stop! You know you can't you can't play for free. You know it's quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> you did have a great reputation as a live band. When, when taking things into the studio to record, it, did you go through any special procedure to try and re recapture that live feel in the studio? It's it's so much more difficult than you think, uh, and it was for us as well because we relied so much on uh, all the verbal and sort of like urging people. <clears throat> that was a big part of it, you know. Um, so, I mean, for live, for example, we, uh, there were very few bands in the end. Uh, I remember we played with American bands like Taj Mahal and lots of other bands, and uh, they wouldn't go on after us. It didn't matter how big they were, you know. I mean, the Birds did it once. They went on before us in um, Munich. And uh, uh, you can imagine my horror as a sort of, t I mean, still green and still kind of like a trying to sort of come to terms with what was going on. And there's this crowd shouting, Edgar, Edgar, through the last half of the bird set. <laughs> and I could have cried, I couldn't believe it. I apologised to them, you know. Ah, oh, that's all right, man, you know, we use, we've done it all, you know, it's cool, it's cool. But that, so the live experience for us was massive. You know, we, we weren't afraid of any band at all live. I mean, we, we, I mean, when we finished, the audience were finished, you know. So to take that into the studio was was incredibly difficult and i'm not sure we ever really did uh i mean as successfully you know in terms of taking something that worked live and actually purely translating that into a recording situation not sure we ever did it really so we we'd take a song in there and we'd jam it around a little bit and when it was kind of as polished as it was going to be we we put it down and um some stuff worked uh, very well live and some stuff didn't you know mainly because we had some orchestration in the early days and uh, there were no samplers or synthesizers then. So th there was material that, um, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't sort of do live at all for a while. Now, there were some live recordings you did at Abbey Road in 1969. Yeah. What's your take on why uh, many of those tracks remained unreleased for so many years? Well, I, <laughs> it is quite possible. Because it was the first live recorded at Abbey Road, I mean, obviously there's been dozens since. And I think it went into the archives, and I think they forgot all about it. And, I mean, what all those record companies do, and EMI are sort of as famous as anybody else for it is, the years go by, and uh, they release stuff, and then they get hold of the band, and they re-release and digitalize, digitally remaster stuff. They get hold of the band, and they say, have you got any other tracks? They know what they've already found, you know, that, that wasn't released. So they ask us if uh, it would be all right to stick those on the re-released album. So what they do is they add a few extra tracks and so on and so on. And I think they'd added all the extra tracks that we had. I mean, uh, there's albums with demos that we made before we were signed and stuff on now, e EMI albums. And then I suppose they ran out of stuff and uh, had a look through the archives and came across that. It's, I don't think it's ever any really intelligent plan or anything. I think they just sort of think, oh, it's time we put out another Edgar Broughton band sort of uh, rehash, and that's what they do. Hmm. So I think that it was probably just lost for, for in time for a while, you know. I don't think anybody was holding on to it consciously for any reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the more notable recordings in your catalogue is, is a patchy dropout, a, a fusion yeah. of, of The Shadows and Captain Beefheart. Do, do you recall how that whole concept came together? Not really, not 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 exactly. I think it was. I think Pete Jenner suggested it, um, our manager and producer, and uh, somebody kicked it around, and it kind of worked. Um, and there were no edits. I mean, it actually was. It was actually played um, like the recording. Interestingly enough, about four or five years ago, 
a British uh, rock magazine that often sort of does specials and puts the CD on the front, did what they called their mashup edition. Um, and all kinds of remix stuff and sample stuff and DJ stuff. And we were credited as being the first mashup. And I, th I think that was quite, quite nice. So Apache Dropout was on the... Uh, on that CD. But Jerry Lorden, who wrote Apache, was horrified by it. I mean, he didn't, he didn't think it was funny or anything, you know. And we wanted to call it um, Drop Out Apache, and he was, he, that was what he dug his heels in over. He said, no, 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 no. If it's going to go out, it's got to be called Apache Drop Out. <laughs> it's, it's a bit like Hollywood, you know, where people argue about a line or yeah. sort of where they're going to be in the credits. It was funny, really. Bless him. <laughs> uh, great, great writer, but he, helped, he was nothing to do with our scene at all and probably despised us all. <laughs> but later in Studio 3, um, we were mixing it, or we were mixing something else, or, and we just had it on the, on the machine. And uh, Peter Mew, who was the engineer at Abbey Road and did most of our stuff, knew that Hank Marvin was in the building, so he got hold of him. And suddenly we're in the middle of this thing, and Hank Marvin walks in through the door. I'll never forget it. I didn't really know what to say, because I didn't, I didn't know if he'd actually think it was dreadful or, it, or, or what, you know. Anyway, he thought it was hilarious, <laughs> loved it, and, and actually said to me, if I'd known, he said, uh, I'd have lent you my echo unit that I used on a package. Oh, wow. Which I thought was really sweet. What a nice man. And, <laughs> and that was a buzz for me, because unlike Beefheart, who I eventually met and uh, was completely disillusioned over after sort of like, Hankering after seeing this guy for years in the UK, he was a complete letdown as a man. Whereas Hank Marvin was was absolutely a gentleman. He was really, really quality. Terrific. And lives here in Australia now too. Yes, yes. Yeah. You, you were never afraid to experiment and try different things uh, musically. Were you always conscious of not being bogged down in, in the one formula? I think that was kind of... Um, I think that was just a sort of carry through from... Even earlier days as kids, you know, at school and stuff, uh, square pegs in round holes and stuff like that. And never really, we were never really accepted uh, later, you know, the, the period that you're talking about by other musicians, uh, apart from the musicians that we were kind of stabled with, if you like, you know, that were part of our kind of organisation and agency. People thought it was a bit much, you know, this, these three chord, what, three chord wonders with sort of silly clothes and a lead singer with a great big mouth and sort of in politics all over the place. They thought that wasn't really music, you know. Um, a lot of people, but uh, they still wouldn't go on after us. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I don't know, really. I, I suppose, yeah, we were always a little bit sort of left to centre and a little bit kind of, a uh, bit dark as well uh, at times, you know. We weren't afraid to kind of, like, uh, stray into uh, taboo areas. I mean, for example, the song um, There's No Vibrations But Wait is about child abuse you know and uh so yeah we we didn't care what anybody else was doing we we just tried to make as much kind of impact by any means as we possibly could i think at times so for you personally what, what at what point or what album do you think the band really came of age many critics will will point to the third album the self-titled yeah. one but was it that one for you too I'm not sure I've got one. I mean, I, I, I see where everybody's coming from on that. And it was, a, it was a kind of small pinnacle, and it was a landmark sort of album for us. Um, but then again, I know someone who's absolutely convinced that Inside Out was the best album of, of that era, you know. And I, uh, people have got, you know, their own opinions, and I, I just go, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, because I, I, I don't know, you know. It's, when you've made it, it's very difficult to actually be... I suppose, objective, you know, mm. but, yeah, it, it was definitely an important album, you know, and, uh, It was around that time you started incorporating string arrangements into, yeah. your, into your music. Was that a direction you were, you were particularly happy with afterward, looking back at it? Uh, yeah, I think it was, uh, it was dead right, you know, I mean, we, some of the songs on the third album, even over rooftops, for example, I mean, the, the strings at the front of that, for me, are kind of, uh, as good as anything that anybody ever else, anybody else ever did on any of our material. David Bedford's arrangements were were perfect for us, really, and and quite strange because uh, you've got this kind of proto punk kids kind of like knocking out all this noise, and then uh, 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 some, an orchestra would come in and sit there with their sandwich bags and their apple and their cheese sandwich, you know, <laughs> and stop every moment they could for a break, you know, and. Uh, probably hated every every note that they played um i mean for example we did a 
We did a single called Up Yours to coincide with the uh, Ted Heath um, and Wilson election here. And we had this little campaign called Kiss My Ass with a poster by Ralph Steadman with a, on one cheek we had uh, Ted Heath and on the other one Harold Wilson. And we put out this single called Up Yours. And at the end was this cacophony of sort of national anthems and the red flag and, you know, the, the international and things like that. Yeah. And this poor orchestra watching this orchestra play in this completely mad, surreal sort of Kafka music, really. <laughs> it was a delight, you know. And asking David, uh, we think this is unplayable. No, 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 you can play that, he said. And uh, are you sure it should be a D flat here and stuff like that? And he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Standing there with his long hair and his jeans. <laughs> and all these chaps in suits and ties and things. As I say, with these sort of... Uh, the absolutely vital um, uh, briefcase uh, with a bit of music in, but mostly cheese and pickle sandwiches and an apple and perhaps a Mars bar, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. So surreal. You know. Yeah. Now, you were you were on the bill with Blind Faith at their legendary gig at Hyde Park to, to yeah. 100,000 people. Do you have any vivid memories of that day? Being really scared. <laughs> I mean, absolutely sort of... It's something that you've wanted to do. You didn't know you wanted to do because nobody had done anything this big, but you wanted to do something big. And suddenly the opportunity's there, and it's, it's not a maybe, it's a definite, and you're there, and standing around this huge kind of like, with this huge audience. And eventually a couple of people played, I don't remember, I don't remember any of that, trying to get rid of the nervousness throw it up a little bit, going on stage and having an absolute ball. It was as, it was often the case. I used to get quite nervous before gigs, but as soon as we hit the stage, it was it was magic, you know. And uh, we had a ball and uh, finished the gig and watched Blind Faith and sort of, it was a lovely sunny day. And I remember walking back through Hyde Park and the West End through Piccadilly and dozens and dozens and dozens of young people coming up and, can I have your autograph? Can I take a picture with you? And, and I suppose that day, you know, rather naively, I thought, that's it, we've cracked it, we've arrived, you know, it was amazing. But it was a fabulous day out, it was, I'll never forget it, I loved it. Uh, the Blind Faith set was released on DVD recently, is there any footage of, of uh, the Edgar Broughton band from that day? There is, actually, um, but it's all, uh, it's all a bit sort of uh, secret at the moment, who's got it, who's got the rights, who's edited it. I mean, I've got a copy of it, uh. which I've played around with, um, I'm, I'm working on a project where I'm hoping to make it uh, a, a little film about what happened that day. So, so the Edgar Broughton band footage is kind of a backdrop to that, oh, yeah. uh, and the audience. And I just, uh, I'm, I'm compiling sort of bits of newspaper and bits of radio that sort of took place on, on that particular day. Don't know if it will ever come to anything, but it, it's fun. Now, I believe you had some management issues at one point that ended up in, in the High Court. Are you able to tell us about that? Well, yes. Uh, there were some people called uh, Worldwide Artists, and, uh, and basically they were gangsters. <laughs> they, they were. <laughs> and it's documented, so I'm not in any trouble there. Uh, one guy who managed just went, to, uh, went off to uh, Chicago and married a, a famous Don's daughter. And, uh, oh, unbelievable stories. Um, and we kind of gave them as much stick as they gave us, really. I mean, I think uh, it, it was a mistake to sign with them. Anyway, uh, we got sick and tired of them, and I think they were sick and tired of us being sick and tired of them, and we got a lawyer, and we took them to court. And, I, and there was a fantastic piece about it in Private Eye, which was hilarious, um, which they didn't like too much, obviously. Hmm. Anyway, we, we went to court, and uh, we... We turned up a couple of times with sort of like, oh, I don't know, a three-foot-high pile of papers to see the judge in chambers. They didn't show up. So he called, he arranged another meeting, you know, and uh, made sure that they knew about this, and uh, they didn't turn up again. Uh, so he gave us everything. He gave us our record rights, uh, all our equipment, the vehicles, uh, which they sort of, uh, they were claiming were theirs, you know. Um, and we, I think we're the, uh, one of the only British rock bands to actually take management to court and get the judge to give us everything, 100% of everything. Because he was so pissed off with the fact that they couldn't be... They, well, they, they weren't together enough to, to produce a case, really. Mm. So, yeah. And um, I'll tell you a little story. There was, there, was, there was an album called Bandages, which was sort of halfway finished. 
and um, we drove past there one day and had a look, and uh, there was a pile of albums in the a pile of big two-inch tapes in the uh, in the foyer. And uh, my roadie said, "I'm going to have a look." He said, "I've got to have a look." He said, "I'm sure." I just feel it anyway. They, that was bandages. I don't know why it was there. So we nicked them, <laughs> put, put them in the put them in the car, and drove off and uh, finished half of it in uh, Oslo, uh, and uh, got a deal with the guy there, Arnie Bendixson at uh, Sonnet. And uh, Mike Oldfield uh, helped us mix the rest at his studio at Urgis Ridge. Um, and he's, he's scattered over it, plays bits of mandolin and stuff. And uh, then we went back to, <laughs> to them because they'd got a right, they'd got some rights over this album. So uh, they put it out in the UK after all this sort of debacle, which was extremely strange. And actually extremely uncomfortable a lot of the time. It, it wasn't a fun time, really. <laughs> Uh, if you could put it down to one thing, what would have been, what for you was the impetus to the in initial splitting of the band in the late 70s? Uh, well, I, I don't know, because we, I, I think we just needed a holiday, really, a proper break. Um, and that's how, that, that's, I don't remember anything specific, really. It wasn't, uh, it's not that someone said this and someone didn't like it, or, you know, it was just one of those things, it just, exhaustion and uh, perhaps he'd run out of ideas for a bit perhaps I had you know I don't know really yeah there are a couple of albums they released under the name of the Broughtons and not the Edgar Broughton band was that a result of a, of a need to distinguish the new lineup from, from your previous work um I don't know what it was really I think it's the most stupid ideas anybody ever had <laughs> uh, because with the Edgar Broughton band and then suddenly there's this album called the Broughtons well you know, who, who, who the hell are they? You know, it was nothing to do with me, I can assure you. Um, I think that was kind of forced on me a little bit, really. Mm. Steve liked it, because somehow that made him sort of, uh, you know, bro being brothers, I, I think Steve quite liked that. I think he, mm. I think Pete Jenner suggested it. Uh, we went back to them, and he was going to put out Super Chip, and uh, said, why don't you, you should call yourself the Broughtons. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea, Steve said. Arthur was a bit put out because uh, he'd been in the Egg Broughton band and now it was the Broughtons, if you see what I mean. Mm. So I thought it was just a stupid idea, really. <laughs> and uh, when we re-released it, uh, we called it the Egg Broughton band again. Now, we didn't hear a great deal from you in the 80s and 90s. What, what was keeping you busy during that time? Well, I had a, had a son, Luke, uh, in, in 1980. And uh, in about 1983 or two, I started doing... Um, sort of part-time youth and community work on music projects and uh, all kinds of stuff, which later read to, uh, led to uh, youth radio. I mean, we had the first legal youth radio station in uh, South London, um, in the whole UK, and uh, won lots of awards, you know, run by young people. I mean, facilitated by people like myself and others. But uh, So that work and that community work was... Um, for me, it was an extension of the band in a way. Anyway, it was all about community. It was about people and folks and struggles and uh, working with people who needed, um, you know, a bit of a leg up and support uh, in their lives. And uh, so I did that for a long time. And, and I only stopped doing that about three years ago, actually. Uh, you know, on and off, some, some consultancy, setting up studios for people and uh, in, in youth and community projects. So that took up a lot of time. And also the 80s was kind of not, not a great time for bands like us, I don't think, really. You know, no. It was a bit plastic. <laughs> now, I believe it was a, an EMI reissue of your early albums on CD that inspired you to, to reform the band. Was there any tentativeness uh, about being able to recapture what you, what you once had? No, not really, uh, because by now we'd got, uh, we'd got sampling and uh, we, I'd been playing around with it for years anyway. And... Uh, my son uh, could play keyboard, so he fired off all the samples for us. Um, and we were able to do, we were able to put the strings into things like uh, Even Over Rooftops, finally. You know, we were able to uh, have that timpani playing over the refugee, you know. Um, so in actual fact, as people said, uh, we were better than ever. I mean, I think that that sort of last incarnation of the band um, was as good as it ever was. You know, I mean, everywhere we went, people said, wow, we do, what's that? We didn't, we, we didn't expect that. Because we were playing the records virtually as they were, you know. Mm. And you had your son, your son Luke involved in the band in, in recent times. That must have been a great feeling for you. 
Oh, it was, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think sometimes, to the chagrin of a couple of the other guys in the band, he was extremely supportive of me and quite, being young, very clear about, you know, what he thought should happen and what he didn't want to play and stuff like that. And we concurred almost on everything because we, we, we were working on material of our own anyway um, and had been for some years in, in my studio at home. So uh, so that was great for me. Um, and there was one other guy in the band as well who was extremely also supportive. And uh, that, that it was just a great time. I, I loved most of that. I mm. mean, I still had horrendous sort of confrontations with Steve, <laughs> but we always did. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it was a great time. Now, you disbanded the, the Edgar Broughton band last year, I think, again. Uh, was there a yeah. p pivotal moment that convinced you once and for all to, to pull the pin on the band? Sorry? What was, that? was there a pivotal moment that convinced you that the time was right to, to pull the pin on, on the band? Well, I, I, I didn't really pull the pin on anything. What happened was we, uh, uh, we did some gigs in Norway. Uh, we did two nights in Bergen. And um, after that... Uh, one of the guys in the band, um, one of the guys in the band, uh, uh, like myself and, and like my son, and uh, uh, had often sort of like, sort of, I, no one ever fell out really, but there was this growing tension and pressure and stuff, and uh, so he left. He left. Uh, he left the band, and um, I think because of. Uh, uh, the response to him leaving the band, my son decided to leave a couple of days later as well. So that meant I was back to a three-piece, and I'd got to replace the person who'd been the musical director for those four or five years after the re-releases, when everything was really, really musically fine. Um, a, a really, and, and a, who was a great guitar player as well. I mean, absolutely, you know, the best. And, uh, and also I've got to find a keyboard player that would actually do what Luke did, uh, which was mostly fire off uh, samples and play the same thing every night, you know, on, on the dot. And who could sing? Both of them could sing really well. And I just thought, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. I can't spend a year or a couple of years looking for a guitar player and then who decides perhaps they don't want to be in the band after all. And, you know, to find people who, who wanted to be in the Edgar Broughton band and do that for, for three or four years was quite an achievement by then. Um, you know, because we didn't work a lot necessarily and uh, didn't necessarily make a lot of money, you know. I mean, who does, you know, in those circumstances? So the idea of going back to square one with a blank sheet of paper, and I just couldn't do it. And because the person who was mainly... I suppose responsible for that particular kind of uh, incident uh, wasn't bothered. Just said, "Oh, I'll just get somebody else." I, I, none of us could believe that, you know. So it, it folded really, and uh, they still haven't spoken to each other. So, mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided that I'd do something different. Um, so I, I uh, there was an old uh, trade union. Uh, I suppose, a slogan, really, when it, from when I was a kid. And it was simple. It was a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. So I advertised uh, that I would play anywhere in the world for my supper, travel costs, and one day's equivalent of whoever was putting the thing together as wages. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, I did 20 gigs this summer on that basis. Fantastic. I've had a ball on my own with an acoustic guitar. And... Uh, that's been going really, really, really well. I've had the best summer for years. Absolutely fantastic. You know, and I did Glastonbury this year with my son. So, you know, that's what happened as a result of uh, the band um, packing in, really. It's a fantastic concept, a fair day's pay for a fair day's work, and it must put you in closer contact with some, with some long-time fans. Well, it does. I mean, I, I usually stay at their place if, if they've got space. And uh, on a couple of these gigs, I've spent four or five days with people, you know, and they show me around their, their locality, and uh, I meet all their people, and uh, it's fabulous, you know, really, really nice. And it takes me back to the days when, uh, with a guitar player friend of ours, Mick Unit, who was in the band in, in, in the early days, uh, we used to hitchhike, you know, from the Midlands to the coast, and... Uh, get ourselves in Sconst in some folk club, you know, and do a few songs and uh, look for a bed for the night. And uh, 
sort of quite Kerouac-esque, really, quite quite exciting as for kids. And I wanted to get back to that, so so I came up with this idea. I, I didn't know if it'd work or if anybody would want to do it at all, but um, yeah, it's been good. It's been really good. So look, looking back over the years, Edgar, if there was any one thing you could go back and, and change, what, what would it be? Oh, that's a biggie, isn't it? <laughs> uh, one of the things I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done uh, and shouldn't have done was signed to worldwide artists. Um, that was that was the kind of that was a mistake. Uh, but but there isn't much I regret, you know. I mean, because uh, well, there isn't anything really very much. Uh, no, I mean, there, there's almost nothing I would change really. It's uh, you know, it's been good and it still is. And how would you like to see the Edgar Broughton band remembered? Um, as the proto-punks, you know, the people that sort of like made a big fuss and a big noise and uh, spouted lots of sort of uh, philosophy and politics and, uh, you know, gave somebody something, something, you know. I mean, I met a guy who told me one day he... Uh, it's amazing at gigs, you know, people come up and tell you the meaning of your songs, and when you're a kid you say, oh, well, in actual fact, it's not quite like that. What, what it's really about is, and then you shut up and you learn that it means what it means to other people. But uh, in terms of the value of it all, I mean, I constantly get people writing to me now because of the internet and stuff and telling me the, imp the effect that it had on their lives. And one example is a guy... Uh, who was uh, my son was at school with, and that's how I met this guy. You know, he said, "You're joking, you're joking." This this kid's is, you know, Edgar Broughton's son. You know, so anyway, we finally met, and he told me that him and his wife uh, Mary they'd been on a caravan holiday in about 1969-70, and he wanted to ask her to marry him, and he'd been building up the courage and building up the courage, and they'd got this little caravan somewhere in Cornwall or Devon, I think. And uh, one night, coming back from the beach, it was a beautiful starlit night, and he took a cassette player, a little portable cassette player, with green lights, our song Green Lights on it, and played it to her, and then asked her to marry him. And she said yes. <coughs> and I suppose if, if, if there's a couple of thousand of those, you know, uh, stories, then for me that's a job well done. That's, that's we, we, we matter to some people. And I think, that's it really absolutely that's what it's all about yeah tremendous and just before I let you go um, recording wise is there anything on, on the horizon we can look forward to well I've I've recorded everything that I've done this year so I've got miles and miles of acoustic stuff different versions of old songs lots of new songs um, and, a, and a show I did called Castaway where I did some readings and some sort of performance sort of art stuff and uh, so I've got lots of material recorded but I've also uh, at the back of my mind, there's there's a band album uh, uh, w within this material, and so uh, later this year, before Christmas, I'm getting together with some guys I've known years, and we're going to have a jam and see if maybe there's a new band in it. So I I I suspect that by the middle of next year there will be a new a new album, which won't just be sort of solo and sort of acoustic-y type stuff. Tremendous, more to look forward to. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Hey, again, thank you so much for your time. It's just a, an absolute pleasure speaking with you, and uh, well, not only for for all the great music you've given us over the years, it's just a treat for me to speak to another Broughton across the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was quite intriguing. Yeah, John Broughton from Australia, wonderful. Well, thank you, John. I've enjoyed chatting, and uh, yeah, fantastic. And uh, maybe one day we'll see you down here. It'd be fantastic to to catch up with you. That would be nice. Tremendous. Thanks a lot, Edgar. All right, mate. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.